How are you going? Welcome back. Uh, we're going to be having a look at Chapter 2 now of the All Island Strategic Rail Review. Uh, let's skip up there now. So, Chapter 2 is the railway as it is today. And there's that nice uh, picture of a commuter train in motion. At dusk, perhaps. So the introduction, this chapter describes the island's rail network as it is configured today, outlines how the network has developed in recent years, and summarizes the current socioeconomic and environmental context on the island. This chapter will show how rail can help support wider policy goals to improve connectivity, enhance accessibility, boost economic growth, enable regional development, and deliver each jurisdiction's climate change goals across the whole island, both for passengers and freight. So, today's railway. A map of the public railways in operation on the island today is provided in figure one. A little peek there, we'll have a look at that in a minute. This map highlights currently electrified sections of the network, as well as areas where infrastructure investment is planned in the short term, such as Dublin's Dart Plus program, or the Foynes Freight Line, and line speed improvements planned for the Derry Belfast Railway. The island of Ireland currently has around 2,300 kilometres of public rail lines. These are, uh, so Erin Road Erin, Irish Rail, is a state-owned railway company in Ireland, operates 1,944 kilometres of the rail network, and Translink, the Northern Ireland Railways, state-owned uh, transport company in Northern Ireland, operates around 357 kilometres in Northern Ireland. So most rail corridors radiate from Dublin and Belfast with several branches off the main routes at these cities. Uh, then the route from Waterford to Atenry slash Galway via Limerick is the only significant cross-country link that doesn't radiate from Dublin or Belfast. Apart from the main lines from Dublin to Cork and Belfast and some short stretches of suburban lines around these cities, most of the rail network is single track railway, which severely limits service frequencies. And I'll, I'll go into that in a bit when we get down to the map. The only electrified sections of the railway are those used by the Dublin Area Rapid Transit Service, DART, a suburban service operating along the coast uh, of Dublin area from Greystones to Malahide and Houth. All of their services are powered by diesel traction. Uh, depends on what you consider railway, but if you consider trams to be like light rail, then the Lewis in Dublin is also electric. Um, I know Belfast says the glider. I don't know if that really counts as a tram because it's not on tracks. It's kind of just like a, a fancy bendy bus. So the Irish gauge of 1,600 millimeters or five foot three inches is used across the island, which is slightly wider than the gauges used in Great Britain and most of Europe. Yeah, most of Europe uses the standard gauge, which is 1,435 millimeters. Um, Russia has their own one, which is 1,520 something. Um, there's an Iberian gauge, but they also use the standard gauge there on like high speed stuff. The Iberian gauge is similar to the Irish gauge. I think it's slightly wider. And then, yeah, standard gauge is used in China as well. A lot of their, all, pretty much all their rail is standard gauge. The Irish gauge is, I mean, it's used in Ireland, of course. Um, and since we're not really connected anywhere else by rail, it, it's kind of okay for us to be using our own thing, but it's a bit problematic for like um, Spain and Portugal to be using like their Iberian gauge if they're doing anything cross-border, which is why um, a, a lot of their high-speed stuff is on standard gauge. And then because of like Russia and ex-Soviet countries, a lot of them are still on the old Russian gauge, uh, which can cause like... I mean, that was one of the problems with getting grain out of Ukraine into Europe instead of by boat. It's difficult to bring it by rail because Ukraine's on that Russian gauge, uh, so is Moldova. Actually, Moldova and Romania have a, a 
a, what's it called, like a night train that goes from Chisinau to Bucharest. Um, but there's like a two hour stop during the night because they have to literally lift up the carriage, swap out the wheels and then put it back down because Romania is on the standard gauge and Moldova is on the Russian gauge. Um, but yeah, so the Irish gauge is used in Ireland, but also some parts of Brazil use it, and also Australia. Australia is a bit of a hodgepodge when it comes to... Uh, and Brazil as well, when it comes to different rail gauges. So the maximum speed permitted on the rail network is 160 km an hour along the lines from Dublin to Cork, Kilkenny and Athlone. Maximum speed on Northern Ireland's network is 145 km an hour between Belfast and Dublin, and on parts of the Belfast Dairy route. Numerous speed restrictions apply on these routes and across the wider network, yeah. especially on the single track lines. At the time of writing, there were 199 passenger rail stations on the island of Ireland. Each of the seven major cities serves as a terminus for rail services. Dublin, Belfast and Cork each have a suburban rail network, although some only it serves a limited number of areas within these cities, while the other cities, Limerick, Derry, Galway, Waterford only have one station each. So Dublin has multiple terminus stations, the busiest which are Connolly, Heaston Pierce, of course, the big boy stations. While it is possible to travel between Connolly and Pierce by rail, Houston and Connolly are not currently connected by passenger rail services. So the key there is passenger rail services. There is, I believe, a line connecting Connolly and Houston, which is just used for like transporting uh, carriages and locomotives. But uh, yeah, there's no passenger services at the moment. That could change. The latter uh, connections by the Lewis tram are possible and future DART services through Phoenix Park Tunnel are, are planned. Uh, yeah, that'd be like uh, DART Plus. This presents wider challenges for the rail network as it makes it difficult to operate direct passenger services between towns and cities in northern and eastern parts of the island and those to the west of Dublin. Surface frequencies are currently relatively low, especially on the intercity network and in regional and rural areas. For many routes, you serve by one train per two hours. It's per, as some only have two services per day. Surface frequencies are significantly higher on the DART, e.g. Uh, Malahide, Greystones, or Malahide to Greystones, and Dublin commuter networks, and on super, suburban services in the Belfast area, such as Bangor to Lisburn. Some freight line freight rail lines in Ireland are also used for sorry, some rail lines in Ireland are also used for freight. These connect Ballina, Westport, and Navan to the ports of Waterford and Dublin. Freight lines from Mayo share track with passenger services services between Mayo and Dublin, along with the corridor from Kildare to Waterford. Freight services to Navan share track with passenger services between Dublin and Drada before continuing to Navan on a freight only line. There are currently no rail freight operations in Northern Ireland. Interesting. So let's have a quick, um, we'll, we'll, we'll compare this to the map. So let's see. So we'll have a look at the dart area first. So current dart goes from Malahide up here, all the way down to Greystones. Um, as far as Bray, it's all double track, but from Bray south down to Ross Lair, it's all single track. Um, out to Hoth, it's also double, and that's all electrified as well as far as Greystones, and between, uh, between Greystones and Malahide, and then Hoth included. And the plan, I believe, is... Um, well, there's a few plans. There's obviously the Air Plus Coastal North, which electrified from Malahide up as far as Drado, and then Air Plus Coastal South, which would go down as far as uh, Wicklow Town. And then there's the Dark Plus West and Air Plus Southwest, which would go out to like Minute, uh, M3 Parkway and Hazel Hatch. And uh, all those lines would be electrified there. 
and that there should be a connection built between, sorry, not a connection, but a passenger rail service put in place between uh, Houston and Connolly. But most rail corridors, yeah, so, see up, uh, all around Dublin, it's all double track, but when you go up north, you know, it, uh, there's, well, there's only really one line anyway, but it goes up to Belfast, Bangor, and the double track just kind of ends there. It's only single track, it was fair to Laren, and then the line out to Derry is uh, only single track as well. And then, uh, yeah, after Maynooth, when you go out all along that line then to Sligo, all single track. It is double track from, but quad track here, I believe, this little section, but it's double track as far, uh, from Hazel Hatch out to Cork. And pretty much the rest is all single track. I mean, there's a tiny bit of double track here, it looks like, but there's, um, yeah, everything else is pretty much single track, which can really affect services. Basically, what that means is, say, if there's a train going from Galway to Limerick, and another one going from Limerick to Galway, uh, say, you know, the Galway one is chugging along, it gets about here. The one from Limerick, which is an Annis, it's, you know, it stopped, it's letting people on, letting people off. And it'll have to wait until the service from coming from Galway towards Limerick reaches the same station so that they can pass by. Because, you know, a station will have two tracks for each platform or more, they have more platforms. Outside the station, it's only one, it's only single track all the way. So basically any, um, interaction or any any like directional differences will have to be managed at the station which is fine if there's not too many services but it really restricts feature plans uh, it, it's hard to really hard to increase um, frequency or any make any adjustments to the timetable if you have to line up the trains at the station at the same time every time like if you if you can just double track the whole thing just send them you don't have to think about it just send them well maybe make a, a decent timetable but otherwise just send them you know all right so let's have a little look at the historic development of the railway so the island's rail network reached its peak around 1920 and um, i'll put that map up again on the screen now with approximately 5,540 kilometers of network. At that time, Ireland had one of the densest railway networks in the world. The railway network, therefore, once served almost every population center across the island. It's quite impressive when you think about it. However, between the 1930s and the 1970s, the network shrank substantially. These closures occurred for two main reasons. One was the perception, common at the time in many parts of the Western world, the rail was a technology that would be surpassed by the perceived convenience of personal road-based transport. And this view was supported by evidence of declining demand for passenger rail. The other was the prevailing economic circumstances arising from the partition of Ireland in the 1920s. So yeah, uh, obviously after uh, partition in the 1920s, after the Republic of Ireland became independent, there was a huge uh, budget deficit really. Um, there was no money and so uh, a lot of the rail was kind of abandoned or left to decay um, you can even see that as well with the school system um, at, you know after that the, the whole primary and secondary education system was basically uh, left up to the Catholic Church um, and even still today, the vast majority of public schools are associated with the Catholic Church in some way or another. And, you know, like, it was necessary at the time, but it's, it's a bit kind of poor that they're still like that, that they're just not really... Especially, you know, cons compared to our European counterparts on the mainland, 
where public schools are generally run by the government in some capacity. You know, I don't think it's really a great idea to have, the, uh, you know, the religious body influencing the uh, education system. I know it's like, it's mostly fine, but in all true primary school, if you're in a Catholic school, you end up doing um, religious classes. And then secondary school, up to the junior cert, you've got religion as a subject for an exam. And you can opt out, but like, that's kind of uh, choosing to be excluded. Because most people will do it. And then there, I think there is a religion exam for the leaving cert, but not many people do it. But there's still classes up to six year for religion. And I mean, like, it is more geared towards like uh, the humanities and philosophy than it is, at least for leaving uh, after the junior suit. You kind of you learn more about people than about uh, people now than people in the past, but like for for the junior suit, I remember the book we had was like. It was like 80% Catholicism, Protestantism, a bit of Judaism, a little bit of Islam sprinkled in. It was like a chapter, a small chapter on that. And then the very front of the book or in the appendix where there would have been sections for like bin, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, it was just a link to a website. There was no chapter in the book and it was never really covered. It was actually never covered at all, really. That's a bit... I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to call yourself a first world country when you're letting all your schools be influenced so much by the church. The church and just like religious bodies in general. So the earliest rail closures were mainly on the most rural lines that struggled for viability as road transport improved. I uh, sorry, yeah, so that's uh, one key thing they say here is perceived convenience. Because uh, at the time, uh, you know, the car was uh, the cool new thing and it was, it was the future, you know, it was the new technology. I mean, it had been around for a little while already, but it was becoming affordable. To the masses was the, the main point. And, you know, it, it is certainly convenient having a car. You know, going from point A to point B, you can just hop in it, go straight where, straight where you want to go. You don't have to take some detour on a bus and, uh, or a train and stop at different places along the way. But it's only... Like, it's convenient for short distances, but for long distance, really, it's not that great. It's good for getting you to difficult to reach places, but most people will be going to another city or another town. And it's just better served by rail, really, or at the very least a bus. You know, because sitting stationary and concentrating for two, three, four, five hours is difficult. It's tiring. You're not physically doing a whole lot, but it's mentally exhausting. Train, you can just sit there. You can take a nap. You can read a book. You can watch a movie. I like the driver has to pay attention, but no one else really does. You, everyone else on the train could be asleep and you'd all get there fine. Uh, so, from the 1950s onwards, 1950s onward, more substantial closures occurred. In Northern Ireland, the government developed extensive motorway building plans and planned to close many railways. The motorway network was scaled back ultimately, but the rail network within Northern Ireland shrunk considerably, leaving most areas west of the river band without service. Closures across the rest of the island's network were more 
gradual, but ended up removing almost all branch lines and cross-country routes not serving Dublin directly. Yeah, that, like, Galway-Limerick-Waterford line is kind of the only cross-country line that doesn't um, go through Dublin. The emergence of the two separated jurisdictions in the 1920s also had a significant impact on the island's rail network. Yeah. The introduction of customs controls on the new border disrupted rail services and impacted traditional patterns of trade and commerce. At the time, there was much less cooperation between the two new administrations than there is today, as such almost all across border routes were closed in the 1950s and 60s, initially in the Northern Ireland side. Uh, this left Cavan, Donegal, Fermanagh, Monaghan, and Tyrone, all without any rail services and just being a single cross-border line between Dublin and Belfast. The rail network stabilised in the 1980s onwards. Since the 1990s, there's been something of a renaissance in rail. i um, go into it a little bit more, but... 1984 is a key year. That was the year when the, uh, the first DART entered service. Um, that was obviously a turning point. It was the first electrified rail in all of the whole island. Still currently the only electrified rail in the whole island. But it really um it, it, it was it was a huge deal at the time having well for the time I should say, having not just an electric rail service but a, a frequent rail service going in and out of the city. Even if it's just along the the coast. It's going through population centres, or well, I should say urban areas. Um, I actually wanted to look into that a bit more, but uh, the RT archives, I tried to, well, I found some news clips from the time, so I wanted to see what the consensus was back then, because you know, like, whenever there's a big construction project, it always tends to go over budget and people always complain and complain and say it's a waste of money it's a waste of time but then inevitably you know it it gets completed people use it and they're like well you know what it's actually pretty good and it pays for itself over time and then some and people kind of forget and move on and it becomes part of everyday life like it's always been there and you know now you wouldn't think twice about the Darish if someone said, should we have built this? Of course, of course, it's it's a vital piece of infrastructure in the city. But I, you know, was the consensus, what was the consensus like in 1984? Were people complaining about the cost, about the viability of it? I don't know. Because I tried to check on the uh, RT archive and none of the clips worked. Uh, the Basically, it was like the links were all dead and I looked at other even more recent clips from like what 2010 and they were all dead as well. And I uh, found a, a thread on boards.ie from 2018 talking about the same issue, saying that it had been happening for several several years already and it's still not fixed. And so uh, not much luck there. Um, and then I looked at a couple different papers to see if I could find just even some written articles from the time. And they all required like a subscription of some sort to view any archived material. So I might look into that at a later date. I'm a student. I don't have a huge amount of money. This is a low budget operation. So the launch of the DART network in 1984, along with investment in the cross-border enterprise service in the 1990s, Oh, sorry, I should say, uh, in common with many other Western countries, the growth and regeneration of cities, along with increasing congestion on roads, has stimulated significant growth in demand for rail. And then the DART launched in the 1984, Enterprise in 1990s, and they highlighted the potential role the railways could play in supporting Ireland's economic growth. The whole island, not just uh, the Republic. This gave both jurisdictions confidence to invest in enhancing and expanding rail services. In the 1990s, passenger services were reinstated between Limerick and Ennis, 
and these were extended to Athen Rye in 2010. Since the turn of the millennium, there have been mo additional reopening of railways between White Abbey and Antrim, between, between Clonsilla and M3 Parkway near Dublin, and between Glathown and Middleton. Both jurisdictions have also invested in improving seat, uh, service frequencies and, and key intercity and commuter routes, such as Dublin to Cork, adding track capacity, notably to the west of Dublin, and investing in modern rolling stock, such as Ireland's intercity fleet and Northern Ireland's new trains program. This recent investment has contributed to a 37% growth in passenger services, sorry, passengers across the whole island between 2011 and 2019. We'll look at that graph in a minute. With the railway reaching a record of serving more than 65 million passengers in 2019, obviously the, the COVID-19 pandemic, while demand fell significantly during the COVID-19 pandemic, there are encouraging signs that demand is fast recovering. In 2022, both Erin Road Aaron and Translink recorded 70% of pre-pandemic demand. Uh, they don't include any figures for 2023, but I would imagine it's even greater. Um, I certainly feel a lot more confident taking public transport in 2023. Uh, I mean, as confident as I would have felt in 2019, you know, I don't have any, I wouldn't even think twice about it. 2021, 2020 for sure, I would have avoided it. 2021, I would have maybe worn a mask. 2022, I was yeah, pretty confident. Maybe wear a mask in an airplane, but on a bus or a dart or a train or whatever. Probably not. Depends how busy it was. Despite this recent growth, however, passenger rail mode share remains low at around 1% of all trips, or around 3% of passenger kilometres, which is lower than most European countries. The EU average for the latter figure is around 8%. Uh, rail freight mode share is also at a historical low of less than 1% of total ton kilometres. Yeah, a bit desperate. Looking ahead, there are grounds to be optimistic. I, for one, am pretty optimistic. There are clear commitments to expand Dublin's DART network, DART Plus program. Big fan, I gotta say, I'm a big fan. Keeping an eye on that. They should be doing, uh, putting in the rolling stock order for coastal north, I think uh, very soon, if they haven't already. Invest in Belfast, or sorry, invest in the Belfast Dublin Enterprise Service, expand and renew rolling stock fleets, double track short sections of the railway, and invest in a multi-billion euro metro links of Will and Dublin. Be excited for that. I think the metro link will be I mean, having a direct connection to the airport from the city be fucking banger. God, I hope it's 24 hours as well. I mean, it should be. It's all underground. Or, well, not all underground. In the city, it's all underground. Outside the city, it's, uh, I think some of it's cut and cover, some of it's in, like, a ditch, and some of it'll be level. And there'll be a small bridge section, I think, north of Swords. Um, but it'll be... Because at the moment, the only way to get to the airport... Well, I've, I've talked about this already in previous video, but it's just, you know, you have to either take a bus or a taxi or get someone to pick you up. A lot of people don't realise, a lot of tourists, I should say, that those, like... Airport buses are a rip-off. Even the Dublin bus owned one, which is like seven euro to get to the airport. Just hop on like the 42. The 42 24 hour bus. It's like what two two three euro brings you to the airport. Slightly slower, but it'll get you there. And it's 24 hours. And it goes both ways. As incredible as that sounds. So here are the passenger journey um, numbers. 2008 was looking not too shabby, but then obviously the, the recession, so it dipped a little bit. And then it was kind of stagnant for a while then. 
See, 2014, 2015, 2016 picks up a lot. 2017, 2018, 2019, it's looking good. Look good in 2019. And then uh, the big one, COVID. And one thing that's interesting you can see here is that there's like a delayed reaction in the drop of passengers with um, TransLink. And that's because uh, Northern Ireland in 2020, at least, is a lot less, lot less restrictive with their lockdowns than the Republic was. So people were still moving around a lot more. I mean, it, it dropped, but not a huge amount. Then in 2021, look, it, it was cut in half very clearly. But good recovery in 2022. And I can only imagine the numbers are even better in 2023. And uh, yeah, it's looking exciting. The future is looking exciting. I can see that for sure. Anyway, let's head into the socioeconomic and political context. So the island's population steadily declined in the aftermath of the Great Famine from a peak of approximately 8.5 million in the 1840s to just 4.2 million in 1960s. That's, yeah, that's quite a decline. That's more than half, sorry, less, less than half of peak population. And of course, that's because of uh, you know, people dying and people emigrating. And up until the 60s, it was very common uh, for, you know, someone to be born in Ireland and then emigrate to America or the UK and grow up there. This decline coincided with the period from the beginnings of the Irish railways to the last, so last of the substantial closures in the mid-20th century. However, since the 1960s, this trend of population has reversed. It's, you know, it's, it's looking good now. And the last half century, the island's population has grown to over 7 million at present. And it's just going up. The number keeps going up. The island's population is expected to grow significantly in the future. Ireland's national planning framework estimates the population will grow by a million people by 2040. It's also called Pro or, it's Project Ireland 2040. I haven't read it myself. I just know a little bit about it. But most of this growth concentrated in cities. And we'll have a look at uh, figure three in a minute. The island has become much more urbanized in that time. And the island's population is projected to grow by a further 20 to 30% by the early 2040s. Increased urban populations make car ownership both less attractive and less necessary. Inducing demand in the opposite direction, you know? You build more rail, you induce rail demand. Or more bus services, you induce bus demand. It's like that with, with cars, you know? You've got a motorway, if it's congested, you don't just build... I mean, you could... So, the obvious solution is build another rail, uh, lane, build two lanes, but then that just creates induced demand. And then, you know, within, for the first month or two, it's great. And then more people go, oh, I'm going to take the motorway now too. And you're back where you started. You want to induce demand in the other direction. Make, uh, so, which makes the role of rail for long distance travel more important, for sure. As such, rail is in a strong position to grow, or a strong position to serve the island's growing population, and this will likely increase over the horizon in this review, especially as planning policies are increasingly promoting demand management and transport-oriented growth around rail stations. Hell yeah. The island has experienced significant economic growth in the last two decades, although the island's economy was severely affected by the Tisnay global financial crisis and COVID-19 pandemic. Well, everyone is affected by both of those. In recent years, the island's economy has benefited significantly from, or has benefited from significant foreign direct investment. Well, it's obviously the big American tech giants that plot their head offices in Ireland because we've got really small, a really low corporation tax, and even then, 
you know, there was that whole fiasco at Apple where they just weren't paying any corporation tax, and I'm sure they weren't the only ones. Because, you know, they, they bring a lot of money to the economy already, and we're just a little country. But sure, look, that's a conversation for a different video. So growth was focused then on Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Galway and Belfast. Especially Dublin. However, many regions of the island, including Derry and Waterford, have not benefited from the same growth as the larger cities and have less access to key services and international gateways. Improved rail connections to the strongest performing urban areas, together with better regional connections and regeneration based around the railway hubs, would improve access to the economic opportunities in these places. There are known challenges regarding the affordability of housing in Ireland, with the highest rent increases recorded in Dublin, Cork and Galway. Oh, it's nuts. I was looking recently for like a basic flat in Dublin. And one that's not a pigsty, it's like easily two grand a month, two and a half maybe. And if you're on minimum wage, that's basically that. Well, no, not even basically. That is all your money gone. That's that's everything. And like you know, you have to have at least two incomes to even keep your head above water. A lack of affordable housing in the major cities means there is a political threat to social cohesion and economic growth. With a lack of affordable housing in major cities, there is potential to enhance rail links to serve more affordable areas within the islands larger cities. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, developing houses and compact transport-oriented developments around rail stations can help promote more sustainable travel outcomes. Compact transport-oriented developments. That's the key. You can't be building these fucking sprawling estates where everyone's got a fucking half a hectare back garden and a car and it's like a labyrinth. It's just not just doesn't make sense, really. So then, you know, it's it's a bad use of land. It's a bad infrastructure investment. Because you have to maintain all those roads. And it's just... It's, uh, it's not a sustainable way to grow. Uh, as uh, And develop, as I said. Compact housing, like compact housing doesn't mean you have to live in a shoebox. There's some gorgeous flats that can be built. But, you know, obviously the one thing is getting them built. One other problem is um, making sure that they're available to residents to buy, to you know, the general public, that they're not just being swept up by an investment fund that's just going to rent them out. People want to buy it. want to buy them. I, I, I want to buy a flat or train station in the future if I can. Whether I'll be able to is a different matter. But I certainly want to. In both jurisdictions, legislation has been passed that commits to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The Government of Ireland has also recently published a Climate Action Plan, which includes measures to reduce the number of car journeys taken, reduce, reduce on-street parking, and prioritise active travel and the use of public transport. So active travel there refers to uh, walking and cycling, really. This plan includes a key goal to increase public transport mode share by 130% by 2030. That's not that far away. It's almost the end of... It is the end of 2023, so that's six years. I would love to see that. Many regional and local authorities in both jurisdictions have made similar commitments and are pursuing similar plans. As one of the least carbon intensive forms of public, uh, passenger transport, rail could play a key role in achieving this object objective. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. I even. Like I have pretty good access already, but I want better access. I want... And what if I... I mean, with the prices in Dublin, are probably going to be 
priced out of Dublin. So I at least want connections to the city, some way to get in there easily. So we'll have a look at these uh, population growth uh, forecast for 2040. So obviously a lot of the growth is around Dublin and the greater Dublin area, which kind of covers Kildare and Meath and a little bit of Wicklow. Cork as well. Cork is going to see a lot of growth. A little bit in Waterford, not a huge amount, but a little bit. A little bit in Limerick. Limerick isn't that big of a city, so, you know. Galway will see a bit of growth as well. A little bit, uh... I think always even smaller than Limerick. Actually, one thing that's interesting is Tala, which isn't on the map here, but it's in the south side of Dublin. Tala is, you know, a part of Dublin, but it's actually larger than Limerick City in terms of population. Neary will see a bit of growth. Neary is a popular destination. If you live near the border, it's a pop popular place to go to do your shopping because they've got those, like, border shopping centers because the food prices are a bit cheaper up the north. So if you're buying in bulk, it's worth it just to drive over the border. And then Belfast is going to see a, bit of, a decent bit of growth as well. But mostly around Dublin, you know. Dublin City, Dublin Bay North, Dublin Bay South, North County Dublin, Fingal kind of area, Dublin West. Dublin South into leaking into Wicklow. It's going to be a lot of growth. Even in Sligo. So they're going to have to plan for the future. You know, plan to actually keep up with the growth. If they just let it sit as it is, it's just going to, you know, compound. Anyway, so the roller rail. Rail has the potential to deliver on accessibility, climate, connectivity, economic growth, environmental and regional development aims across the whole island. What a wombo combo, both for passenger and freight flows. Accessibility, I mean, look, you want people, you want to cater to the whole population. You can't be leaving people out. And it's not even just ignoring people in wheelchairs. Parents with boogies and prams and small children and people with fucking, you know, bikes and scooters and whatever. They all need access as well. Climate goes without saying. I keep bringing up how important it is to achieve these climate goals and uh, go further even not just achieve them because they're they don't go far enough really uh, connectivity oh don't get me started in connectivity I want to be able to travel across the whole island corner to corner to corner to corner without any kind of personal vehicle involved I want trains trams buses the works. Metro. Oh, metro. Yes, please. Economic growth. The benefits everyone, you know. Environmental. Well, that kind of ties in with climate. And regional development. Look, you want to decentralize from Dublin. It's too... Everything's in Dublin. You need to spread it out a bit. Not, not like housing developments but like the economy it's too concentrated in Dublin you know small towns are dying and regional development well in the form of rail would help to revitalize them it make them a viable place to live even if people aren't you know working for the local butcher or in the, the local super value if they're living there, they're going to be spending money there. And they could be working in a remote job that's based in Dublin that they have to go to two times a week in person. 
But if there's, you know, if there's a train, it makes it so much more attractive. They can change the economic landscape of the island by unlocking re regeneration and growth opportunities, attracting investment, and supporting sustainable development. As part of, the, of an integrated transport solution, the rail system could evolve to be a stronger backbone of the public transport system, providing a core network of connectivity between urban areas and regions that is an attractive travel option to a range of customers and businesses. A backbone is an integral but interdependent component to any system, which delivers value through integration with other components. In a public transport system, this means enhanced regional connectivity into the main railway nodes, facilitating last mile connections, providing intermodal terminals for freight and integrated ticketing and trip planning for a seamless public transport travel experience. I've said it before, I'll say it again, integrated ticketing. Well, that's key to a, one of the keys to a seamless public transport travel experience. You know, you don't want to be fiddling in your wallet for three different transport cards or tickets or whatever. You want one, even if it's, you know, even better if it's on your phone, because you always have that with you. You're kind of screwed if you lose that, because then you, you lost everything. So I think it's good to have options. I would rather have a physical leap card. But like, I just want to tap away and forget about it. I don't want to be worrying about tickets and I love that you know in Dublin the the card system is great and it's great in Galway and Limerick and Cork and I don't know is it in Waterford it might be haven't been there in a long time rail should not compete with other complementary elements of the system but instead provide a vital pillar upon which the other elements can function. To realize this, rail will need to grow its share of travel. Research, such as the CSO National Travel Survey, I think that's the Central Statistics Office, shows there are several features of a passenger rail service that can be improved to boost ridership. These features are, well connected, enables passengers to complete most of the journeys directly, well, the more direct it is, the more convenient it is, the more people want to use it. I don't want to be changed. I don't mind changing once or twice, but the less changes, the better. Accessible and easy to use. Of course, that's key. If it's in any way complicated, people will just avoid it or be less inclined to try it out. Portable. Oh, I mean, yeah, if it's, it's. Is it public transport if it's expensive? You know, you want to be serving the public. And to serve the public, you need to make it within reach in terms of finances. Frequent. Yeah, I mean, if there's only one bus a day, no one, who's that good for, you know? Because it's not just about getting commuters in and out of cities to work. It's about providing transport for life. You know, it, it, you got a doctor's appointment, hop on the train, hop on a bus. Cycle there even, if it's viable. You know, if you've got, if you've got, uh, you got to go to college, you got to go pick up your child from crash, whatever. You know, it's got to be frequent and reliable. Fast, you know, I think that, that nothing needs to be said about that. You want it to be fast. If it takes too much of your time, too much time out of your day, it, it loses its value to you. Pleasant and comfortable to use. Well, that goes kind of along with the accessible and easy to use. If it's an enjoyable experience, if it's got low barrier to entry, if it's attractive, People are going to use it, and if they like it, they're going to continue to use it. If they have a bad experience, even just once, it can completely ruin their perception of it. 
While there are some examples on the island where the railway is competitive against other modes, in many cases it falls short. The review has identified many opportunities for rail to significantly improve its competitiveness and grow its market share. Some opportunities can be delivered quickly, while others will require a longer term intervention. In general, rail is best suited to the corridors with highest demand between major cities and largest towns. One of rail's key strengths is its spatial efficiency. Oh my god, don't get me started. You look like a, a, a train station in a city compared to the footprint of an airport. And obviously an airport has a different function. Airplanes are much larger. They need more space for takeoff and landing. They travel much further. But if you're just going from Dublin to Galway, you know... You want, uh, in terms of spatial efficiency and accessibility, train station is so much easier to get to. You just, if, if you're, you know, if you're in the city already, it's right there. And you just, you know, it, 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 it can be there because it takes up so, such a small footprint. You can't slap a fucking airport in the middle of Dublin city because you'd have to demolish half the city. Anyway, let's have a look at figure four here. So this is the capacity of different transport modes, passengers per 3.5 meter lane slash track. All right, so this is the uh, efficiency of uh, uh, carrying people. So mixed traffic, I assume this is cares, it's not quite clear, bus, I mean, it's small, but it's already a huge jump. Cyclists. Yeah, bicycles are actually very space efficient, you know. One car versus one bicycle. The car is obviously much faster, but it takes up so much more space in the road. Most of the time, it's only got one person in it. Obviously, you can fit five people in a normal car, more if you have a bigger car, but usually it's just one person. Pedestrians, obviously person walking they don't take up much space bus rapid transit a little bit higher light rail transit that's like trams and stuff a little bit higher and then big bump up heavy rail london another little bump mass rapid transit london and look at this boom mass rapid transit hong kong the density is chef's kiss oh beautiful Tied to this efficiency, rail is one of the lowest emitters of carbon on a passenger kilometre basis, as shown in figure 5, we'll have a look at that in a sec. The carbon footprint of electric railways, even those that operate at very high speed, is significantly lower than other land modes except active travel. Climate policies, well obviously, there's no carbon, carbon footprint for active travel. Well, maybe for bikes, you have to construct them, but for like walking... You just walk, you know. And I guess there's a carbon footprint to your food production, but you're going to be eating that anyway. Whether you walk or not. Climate policies have been introduced in both Ireland and the UK that legally require large reductions in greenhouse gas emissions over the coming decades. The enhancement and expansion of rail services is a key component in, maintain, er, in meeting decarbonisation targets, particularly if combined with electrification of the rail network. Rail is also ideally suited to forming the core of compact transit-oriented development. These communities have higher density densities than the car-centric urban sprawl that has proliferated across the island in the last half century. Just think of uh, those labyrinthian uh, housing estates with nothing in them. and many social, economic, and environmental benefits. Higher density support a larger number of services within walking distance, reducing the need for short distance car trips, while rail provides for longer distance journeys. These types of development contribute to a more equitable society by reducing forced car ownership and barriers to travel for non-drivers. 
that's an important one. Barriers to travel, barriers to entry. If you have to drive a car to get to your job, and you don't have a job, well, good luck getting one. You, you, like, unless you can borrow some money or someone is, is generous enough to lend you their car or buy you a car. Car is expensive, not just to buy, but to run. You know, bus, swap two euro, hop on the bus. Get you pretty far as well. And, you know, once you can get to your job and you can earn a bit of money, then you can sustain that uh, cost of travel much easier. But, it, it, but it's a low barrier to entry is the point. Heavy rail is less suited to supporting lower demand corridors and more isolated communities, but it can complement regional bus service that could connect these communities to a wider public transport system. Yeah, I think I mentioned that before uh, looking at the map of the future rail plans that this proposes. Because there will be communities that will be left out just because they're low density and low priority, but they still deserve access to rail services and transport services. And those regional bus services, such as TFI Local Link, will be key for that. But it's not really talked about in this. Rail uh, can provide access to journeys for those with no access to car and can attract demand from more carbon intensive modes. As I mentioned before, that's induced demand for rail and pulling demand away from other transport modes, mostly car. It is notable that areas of the island that are not served by the railway also have relatively high levels of deprivation. This underlines the potential wider role rail could play in supporting regional economic development and rebalancing the economy across the island of Ireland. That's a very important goal to have and to achieve. Heavy rail can also play a role in supporting sustainable freight logistics and transport system. It is particularly suited to the traditional bulk freight market, which are generally non-time critical flows, as well as the growing market in intermodal goods and parcel services, which are more time critical. As this report will describe in chapter four, rail freight is generally considered to be most competitive over relatively long distances. In Ireland, this means the potential role of rail freight will be focused on serving inter-regional journeys between the island's largest cities and busiest ports. Let's have a little look at figure five here. Greenhouse gas emissions by transport mode, petrol car is the most. I'm not sure how many, so this is grams per passenger kilometer. Not sure if it's taking into it or uh, how many people it's estimating are in the car, but often it's just one. Uh, diesel, a little bit lower, but still pretty high. Short haul flight, it's higher than you might think. Short haul flights, or flying in general, is very carbon intensive. Taxis, I mean, that's just a car, but there's two people in it. Or maybe more. At least two. Ferry, car passenger, pretty high. Hybrid car, higher than you might think. Uh, still a lot lower than the petrol or diesel car. But they're still burning fuel. And... No, they're still, they're still uh, a carbon footprint for producing them, for manufacturing them. Bus, slightly lower, higher than you might expect, actually. But still, you know, not too bad. Motorcycle is lower than I would have expected, to be honest. I'm not sure what they're assuming the uh, ridership is for the bus or how many people they assume are on the motorcycle. I would assume one for the motorcycle. Electric vehicle, Great Britain. It's lower, but it still has a decent carbon footprint just because of the manufacturing costs. And it could be higher depending on where the electricity is sourced from, if it's from burning fossil fuels or if it's from renewable sources or nuclear. Rail, Great Britain, a little bit lower. Tram, even lower. Subway London, even lower than coach. 
I'm not sure if that's a bus coach or it's not quite clear. Uh, ferry foot passenger quite low, and then the Eurostar rail. And that's it for chapter two. Next will be chapter three, the case for change. There's some lovely folks. That's the old uh, timetable boards. I don't have them anymore. They're all like digital LCD screens now. I don't know what station this is. It's a bit blurry. Anyway, cute couple holding hands. Maybe they're taking a trip back to the 90s, judging by those genes for the early 2000s. But yeah, so next time we'll head into chapter 3, and I think it's a little bit shorter than chapter 2. Oh, that's a nice uh, picture of Dart there. So that's, uh, it's calmly up there, and this is heading down towards uh, across the river towards Tower and then on to Pierce and further south after that. Yeah, that's the, that's the bus Aaron, uh, big bus station there. You can see the Lewis tracks as well. It was around it. Lovely. All right. Well, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.